Don't let his youthful appearance fool you. He has been around quite a while in several variations of the trio format. He also was Lionel Hampton's band leader during the 80s. Would you welcome, please, Thomas Chapin with Mario Pavone on bass and Michael Sarin on drums. Thomas Chapin. and you're all alone and you don't know what's going to happen. What's great is that you don't know what's going to happen. And you don't know what you're going to do. I don't know what I'm going to do. And I like that. Tremendous energy. Both a creator and an inspiration. Completely free. He was very disciplined. I mean, he was a real character. Highly curious kid. He determined a 25-year-old white kid ends up as leader of Lionel Hampton's band. The traditional avant-garde. People responded to what he did. He was able to bring people to the other side. At the high point of an ascending career, the whole world in front of him, and then he's gone. It was such an enormous tragedy for everyone touched by him. I first met Thomas in the early 1990s when his music began to take off. I watched him grow and play on the big stages of jazz and saw his many records come out. When he died, I felt very, very sad. Two days after his passing in a Providence, Rhode Island hospital, my sister and I searched for the New York Times so we could read her husband's obituary. As I waited in the car and flipped on the radio, an NPR station was paying tribute to Thomas. It was at that moment that I realized that Thomas was somebody. He was somebody important. And I knew as a filmmaker I would have to one day tell his story. It's been 15 years since he passed, and that time has come. I am ready to tell the Thomas Chapin story and to share with you some of my recent research footage. The story of Thomas Chapin is of a, of just of a kind of a dynamic man. He was a bridge. He was an enormous bridge. There was a schism between the traditional jazz community and the so-called avant-garde or total improvisational jazz community. He moves so fluently between um, tradi the traditional jazz idiom, swing, to something altogether different, completely free, unique, highly individualistic. The way that he did it and the way that the trio did it made so much sense that anybody could listen to it. And Thomas was totally a bridge to that. And maybe it might have been the first bridge between those two worlds. Thomas Chapin's story is about someone who's, who's true to what they believe in and what they do. Someone who plays music where the music they play is, is an extension of their life. So you hear him play, you, you talk with him, you hang out with him, it's all the same thing. For me, the Thomas Chapin story is, is that, watching the evolution of, of this artist and also his effect, that effect on other people along the way. Because that's what happens, it radiates out, you don't know it, but you're like planting seeds all over, you're touching people here and there, and then they in turn go and inspire somebody else maybe in a different way.
He is, in my estimation, one of the last great creators in the music who actually was moving the needle, was moving the music forward, not just playing in an innovative fashion, not just bringing something new to the table as a performer, but who actually was, in, was, was both a creator and an inspiration in which musicians who performed with him brought out the best aspects of what they did. Here's this like ordinary 50s New England family where this kid's born into it and how did that happen? You know, yeah. it's like how did we get from here to there? Yeah. <laughs> One of the funny ironies of Tom's life story is that it was a family tradition that he should go to this fancy prep school, Andover, which my father went to and I went to, okay. and so it was expected he would go there. And, you know, the whole track there is you go to Yale or Harvard or Princeton, and, you know, you enter that whole <laughs> thing. And he comes to Andover, and he meets this teacher. This guy had a reputation in jazz, and this was a really important person for Tom because he's the guy that introduced Tom to jazz. And within this traditional prep school, he found his escape from all that tradition. And it gave him the ticket out of that whole trap. Thomas now, he's got the shot with him. And of course, Ham loved him. This kid, this, this white wasp on New England that was suddenly a big deal in what was largely a black band, playing black music, and doing really well at it. By working so closely with Hampton, being his music musical director and his lead alto player, and dealing with him on tours in the way that all the old big swing bands used to play, you know, you know, traveling together and living together. He bridged the gap between today's world and the old swing bands because of all his work with Hampton. He always, you know, he, he said, I, I push just as far as I can <laughs> without Hampton getting, you know, a little nervous, you know. But he, he'd go out there pretty far and still it was within the framework of the big band. You know, they talk about people being entertainers or performers as well as musicians. And, uh, I think that he definitely had that ability too. And a lot of it just came from his his energy and his uh, passion. But also, you know, he, he had some pretty crazy clothes he wore on stage and he moved a lot. He wasn't just going through these physical gyrations to try to get audience response. I think that was the music. That's how he processed the music coming from him. He did it without drugs in any way, completely without drugs. So he had this incredible energy. He was a taskmaster, master. He was a hard worker. He was hard on the trio with Mike Serena and myself. Uh, and we rehearsed endlessly, three, four times a week for all of the seven years. We never stopped adding new material. Thomas was deep, very deep. He was deep musically, he was deep uh, emotionally, he was deep spiritually. He had something to say, and when he picked up his instruments, he knew that. He was committed to it. It wasn't um, anything unnatural to him. It was extremely at the much the core of his being. That sort of beautiful vibe was always there. You know, from the first time I met him to the last time I met him, he had this kind of gleam in his eye that, that would make me smile. He had become so pure of heart and uncompromised in his love of life and freeness of spirit that people were just wildly attracted to him. He, he someone had broken through. And someone that, you know, we all admire people like that who are so much themselves. And whatever had held them down, they were beyond it. Whatever was holding them down, musically, whatever, he had broken through that. 
whatever was holding him down emotionally he had broken through that whatever ties were pulling him down as they pulled down everyone in the world he had very few at the end and you know yeah, I think he basically just floated into another realm at the end because there wasn't much holding him down, you know. The notes could go right through you. They were just piercing and the emotional content and the, and the, the energy that he could communicate was profound. But this was an exceptional musician, an exceptional human being. Was extremely moving. He had recorded this album and he just felt like it was the, the highest level of music that he had ever achieved. The week before he left for Africa, I do remember feeling like oh, that, you know this was something that could get a wider audience. When he left for Africa, he basically told me that he had this calling. He was on his trip to Uganda and Kenya uh, and Tanzania and Zanzibar. But by the time I met him in Zanzibar, he just looked under the weather. In the end, we never had any traveling together. I just uh, kind of took him to the airport and sent him home. After I came back, uh, Terry called me and said that uh, Thomas had leukemia and was in the hospital. It was a year, pretty much a year, and it was such tough going. Um, <sighs> Uh, I think he was hanging on to life in a very tenacious way. He wanted to live, he wanted to to play, he wanted to be part of life, and he did not go out willingly. There was a concert event for him in Manchester, Connecticut, where he was from, honoring him. All these musicians had come up from New York and were doing this benefit concert. I mean, it was, there were people turned away. It was uh, incredibly emotional for me to hear him play with that much passion and energy when you knew that there wasn't much left. It was his last energies and he poured his last energies into that. And he was in a coma later that day, I think, or the next day. Everything was working toward this moment to play one last time and he was resolute if this was the end. And so that's, that's, that's how I know he was at peace and that he gave everything at the end. He gave everything for the music that he loved and for the people that he, that he loved and that loved him. He did a lot of stuff in a short amount of time. 10 years, a lot of, you know, 15 records or 20 records. I'm glad that people are still learning about him. You know, I get young people coming in once in a while and I'll have a CD on and I'll go, who is this? I said, Thomas Chapin, he said, is he still around? I said, no, he's not around, but there's still a lot of records to buy. That indomitable will, that indomitable spirit, that spiritual focus was able to achieve at a level that simply should not have been able to be achieved during the time that he achieved it. I mean, things have changed in, in the 15 years since his passing, but his music still holds up very well. There are players that now bring together these two fields. The music moves on, and partly because of Thomas's and the trios amongst all many great artists. But uh, there's not many players, or if any, playing exactly with bringing these elements together. And so it, he still remains unique. His music still remains unique. Uh, his pursuit of it is unique. The fact that he's somebody who nobody knows, that becomes a justification for making a film because he should be known.